for those of you who may not know who I am, I'm, I'm Bob Betts. I'm the office man at, manager at Concerned Christians for the past almost 10 years. Um, I've never been LDS. I became a Christian in 1970. Uh, my journey into Mor ministry to Mormons started in 1995 when I read a book called The Mormon Murders. I can't take the time to tell you about it, but uh, it hooked me, and I began reading everything I can get my hands on about Mormonism, and most of what I got my hands on were the books put out by uh, Utah Lighthouse Ministry, uh, Sandra and Gerald Tanner. Uh, I was so interested in this that I called their ministry and asked if I, I talked to Sandra and I asked if I could come up there and just interview her for a while. And she said, well, maybe I can give you an hour. I said, okay, I'll take it. And I drove all the way from Mesa to Salt Lake City and she gave me three hours. Thank you. <laughs> Here's Sandra. afternoon at the uh, issues relating to the Mormon testimony. In talking with members of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the differences between it and the standard Christianity, I often find the Mormon will revert to, quote, bearing his testimony. LDS Apostle Russell M. Nelson gave a typical testimony at the end of his October 2010 conference address. And let me just state first, I had noticed for the last few years under Hinckley that we weren't getting the same kind of testimony at the end of their talks. If you look in the enzymes, or the Mormon magazines where they give conference talks, that there wasn't the formula uh, as often. And I know this is the only true church. I know Joseph Smith's the prophet of God stuff. But it's reverting back. And I don't know how much of this is Monson uh, and his influence, but... They, there seems to be an effort to pull back into more standard ways of speaking and doing things. So, uh, anyway, so this is uh, Nelson's testimony. I know that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church. The Book of Mormon is true. Joseph Smith, its translator, and the prophet of this dispensation. President Thomas S. Bonson is God's prophet today. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Standard Mormon testimony. If you ask a Mormon how they know that Joseph Smith is a prophet or that the LDS church is the true church, they will usually respond that this burning conviction, this special feeling, came as a result of prayer. This burning in the bosom is based on a passage in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 9, verse 8, on how to determine God's truth. <clears throat> Quote, you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it's right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. And that is the whole Mormon testimony. How do you feel about something? However, simply having a good, good feeling about something does not necessarily make it so. I have had people come from various polygamous groups, bear similar types of testimonies, recounting spiritual experiences that convinced them to embrace Warren Jeffs or one of the other polygamous leaders. The Bible warns us in 1 John 4, 1, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So on what basis should I take a Mormon's testimony more seriously than anyone else's? Obviously, the testimonies of people to numerous different religious movements can't all be right. This is why Paul warned in Galatians 1.8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So here we have the test. Are their teachings the same as the teachings and doctrines of the New Testament? LDS missionaries challenge potential converts to put Mormonism to the test, by praying about the instructions 
uh, by, to the Book of Mormon from Moroni 10.4. So this is the formula. Ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if you, you shall ask with sincere intent, with sincere heart and real intent, that's the key phrase here, real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. This sets up the investigator to either affirm what the missionaries have said or else to be labeled as one who did not pray with real intent. Because obviously, if you prayed with real intent, you would come up with the Mormon answer. So the Christian, however, it all comes down to comparing the doctrine of anyone who claims to speak for God with that of the Bible. In the book of Acts, we read how Paul preached to the Jews in Berea regarding the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies related to the Messiah. Unlike the Jews in Thessalonica, the Bereans, mentioned in Acts 17, searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Here we have the biblical test of a message. Not whether we had some sort of spiritual experience, but does the message agree with the Bible? Paul did not tell them to go home and pray about it. Don't get me wrong, I have had many spiritual experiences confirming God's truth to me, but those feelings must always be in line with what God has already revealed in the Bible. My earliest memories of the LDS Church included their monthly fasted testimony service where members of the congregation are invited to come to the pulpit and share something about their faith. Often parents will encourage their young children to go to the podium and say something similar to the phrase read at the start. All through your life, you're encouraged to affirm that you know the LDS Church is God's true church. Not simply that you believe. In fact, sometimes a parent will stand behind the child and prompt him to say those words. I know this is the only true church and the parent is mouthing this to the child to say this. While I agree with the basic philosophy of training young children in their faith, I am troubled by the LDS methods that seem to border on brainwashing. In 1983, LDS Apostle Boyd Packer commented on the process of acquiring a testimony. This is a quote. It is not unusual to have a missionary say how can I bear testimony until I get one? A testimony is to be found in the bearing of it. The skeptic will say that to bear testimony when you may not know you possess one is to condition yourself. So that's what the skeptic would say. That response is manufactured. But, so he goes on to say, but bear your testimony of the things that you hope are true as an act of faith. The spirit and testimony of Christ will come to you for the most part when and remain with you only if you share it. So just say it enough times and you'll come to believe it. So, you know, I mean, these were missionaries that were saying, how can I say my testimony when I'm not sure about it? You know, just keep saying it and, and you'll get it. If you assert something enough times, you probably will come to believe that it's true, but that method would work for almost anything. Let me tell you a book, about a book I recently purchased at an LDS bookstore. Okay, got behind my photos here. DNC. All right, this is the book. The Testimony Glove. This is written by an apostle's wife. Uh, Kristen Oakes is the wife of Dallin Oakes. And this is published by Deseret Book. And through this book we get a glimpse of what the LDS Church thinks are the basics of their faith. First, children are instructed that the glove in this represents the Holy Spirit. So now I've got to get my glove out of the, then the packet. Okay, someone said the white glove reminded him of Michael Jackson. <laughs> I don't dance. <laughs> okay, so this is a testimony glove.
And uh, these little uh, pictures that are on it, I'm going to explain to you what they are. Um, just a manufacturing note, they didn't attach them very well. The theory is that these come off on Velcro and, and you instruct the kid how to put them up one by one. And I had all planned to do that for you, but when I tried to take them off, the whole thing fell apart. So I had to reattach them myself, so I can't uh, put them on one by one. Okay. The white glove represents the Holy Spirit to guide you into truth. And the five truths that you need to arrive at are these on these pictures. <clears throat> so the first one on the thumb is a picture of Heavenly Father. <clears throat> and they took uh, this Mormon drawing of Joseph Smith seeing the Father and the Son. And uh, you notice they look just like each other. Uh, that's because that's a father and son, see? So, of course, they look like each other. And uh, so they, they cut out the father part, and that's what's on the little thumb picture here, is the head from that picture. So the child then is taught, so that's your first one. <clears throat> the child is taught that we once lived in heaven with God, and that Heavenly Father made a great plan of happiness for us so that we can live with him again after we die. The book includes an illustration of their view of our journey from pre-earth life to death to earth and then on to one of the three levels of heaven. The next they attach is a picture of Jesus to the index finger. And uh, this is to represent Jesus, the son of our heavenly father. It is then explained that Jesus is our savior and redeemer. Next is a picture of Joseph Smith holding the golden plates of the Book of Mormon. The child is then instructed that Joseph Smith saw Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ who called him to be a prophet and to restore the gospel and translate the Book of Mormon. The fourth one is a picture of the Salt Lake Temple. The child is instructed that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Savior's true church and that by seal being sealed in the temple, uh, the child's family will be together forever. On the last finger, the child places a picture of the current prophet, in this case, Thomas Monson. From this, the child is to conclude that the LDS church is the true church which is led by a living prophet who gets revelation from God and that she is to follow the prophet. As the child continues to attend LDS classes, she will be given more in-depth instruction on the five concepts presented in this book. This book is like a children's book. It has heavy, strong uh, pages, uh, and there aren't a whole lot of them, and it goes through each of the points in the book for the child to learn how to present, how to say their testimony. And the whole point of this is to train a little child on these five points that you have to include these five points to have said a good testimony to somebody. And the book goes on to tell how she goes to one of her little classes and the teacher asks about, can anyone tell us what a testimony is? And the girl says, I can. And she gets up with her glove and goes through the five points. And you know, so uh, anyways, so that's the way they do it. Okay, so now we're going to go back and look, if I can get my glove off, uh, and look at these five points a little more closely. First is the LDS doctrine of Heavenly Father and his great plan of happiness. Since the days of Joseph Smith, the LDS leaders have consistently taught that God was once immortal. After death, he received a resurrected body and advanced to godhood, which would necessitate a higher God to oversee the world on which our Heavenly Father grew up. The 2002 LDS Manual Gospel Fundamentals informs us that, quote, our Father in Heaven was once a man who lived on an earth the same as we do. He became our Father in Heaven by overcoming problems just as we have to do on this earth. End of that quote. The implication of that statement would be that God was once a sinner like you and me. Because if he had to learn like me and overcome like me, then it would have to be saying that he was a fallen man. The book goes on then to say, the manual informs us, <clears throat> Heavenly Father has a resurrected body of flesh and bones. And when they speak of the resurrected body, you have to understand that's because they believe he had an earth life as a mortal before he became God. LDS past president Joseph Fielding Smith explained that our Heavenly Father had a father and a grandfather and so forth back through the eternities. Quote, our Father in Heaven, according to the prophet, 
had a father, and since there has been a condition of this kind through all eternity, each father had a father. So you see the eternal progression of gods here. God, grandpa God, great grandpa God, great great grandpa God. Okay. However, Joseph Smith's doctrine of God is in direct contradiction to the teachings of the Bible. In Malachi 3, 6, we read that God does not change. And Psalms 92 declares that he is from everlasting to everlasting. In Isaiah 44, 6 and 8, God instructs Isaiah, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. If God doesn't know of a God above him, then I think we're pretty safe in feeling that the Mormon doctrine can't be true. And as I mentioned in my earlier talk, he didn't change these verses when he revised his Bible. In fact, the concept of a mortal man advancing to the position of God is the most heretical doctrine of Mormonism. Once you make God, once a man that progressed to Godhood, you have set in motion the whole Mormon plan of eternal progression. So you have to understand that it isn't just that the Mormons are wrong on salvation. It's not just that they're wrong on repentance uh, or you know individual parts of Christianity. It's this whole worldview of God, man, and the universe, of how they feel it all functions. Uh, if God had a beginning, it corrupts the nature of God, and it elevates man and pulls God down. Coupled with the LDS concept of God is the doctrine of eternal progression or plan of happiness, as used in the testimony book. The teaching of man's eternal progression is the bedrock of LDS doctrine. In the October 2010 conference, Apostle Hales explained, before we came to this earth, Heavenly Father presented his plan of salvation, a plan to come to earth and receive a body, choose to act between good and evil, and progress to become like him and live with him forever. To become like him in Mormon parlance means becoming a god, not just Christ-like. You have to understand, whenever they use this phrase, we're becoming like God or like Jesus, they mean literally they're hoping to become a god. This concept also assumes that there is a heavenly mother. Because heavenly mother and heavenly father had to procreate us literally in a pre-earth life and then set in motion the plan for our advancement to godhood. Joseph Smith declared, you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, end of quote. In the LDS view, we are literally spirit children of heavenly parents and are the same species as the gods. While Christians talk of being children of God, they are using the term in a spiritual sense, not biologically. Paul wrote about our spiritual adoption in Romans 8, 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, out, cry Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But notice there's nothing there about it being literal or biological we are adopted into the family of God. In uh, the classic LDS book, Articles of Faith by Apostle James E. Talmage, we read, we believe in a God who is himself progressive, whose majesty is intelligence, whose perfection consists in eternal advancement, a being who has attained his exalted state by a path which now his children are permitted to follow, whose glory it is their heritage to share, in spite of the opposition of the sex, meaning Christian community, in the face of direct charges of blasphemy, the church proclaims the eternal truth as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. And yes, I would say it is a great blasphemy. So when Mormons speak of becoming God-like or Christ-like, they are not speaking of some sort of spiritual growth, but of their hope of advancing to actual godhood, the same as their heavenly father did before them. This would include their children, born on some future world, worshiping the man as their god. This, would clear, this was the clear intent of the 1997 edition of Gospel Principles. 
it declared that those who achieve exaltation or godhood would then procreate spirit children who will, quote, have the same relationship to them as we do to our Heavenly Father. What's your relationship to your Heavenly Father? You pray to Him, and He offers you salvation. Then if your children, born on some future world, are going to have the same relationship that you do to your Heavenly Father, the implication is your children will pray to you. I find most Mormons say, oh, I don't know that we believe that. I said, well, uh, your prophets evidently do, because that's what they're putting in the manuals. But... Um, a lot of times they don't read their own doctrinal books very closely. Thus, the spirit children of the LDS man will be sent to the world he creates to become mortal, and they will pray to him the same as he does to Heavenly Father. Keep in mind that the Mormon is not saying that he will one day be equal to Heavenly Father. The LDS concept is one of a hierarchy of gods, with each god in submission to the one before him, and each god receiving the worship of his own spirit children. So you have to think in terms of an eternal escalator. God got on at one level, he's moving up. Jesus got on at one level, he's moving up. You get on at one level, you're moving up. And everybody's moving up. And so our God gets to be a more powerful God all the time by overseeing greater creation underneath him. But Jesus or the Mormon man will never be equal to the Father. They will never replace him. They will always be under his jurisdiction. But it's because of this internal hierarchy that's advancing. And so at some point, the Mormon man would expect to be at the level our Heavenly Father is right now, but our Heavenly Father would have moved higher up. So everybody's moving up the chain of advancement. In the Mormon manual, the Latter-day Saint Woman, Basic Manual for Women, published in 2000, they quote this statement from past President Lorenzo Snow. When two Latter-day Saints are united together in marriage, Promises are made to them concerning their offspring that reach from eternity to eternity. They are promised that they shall have the power of and the right to govern and control and administer salvation and exaltation and glory to their offspring, worlds without end. Notice that it says they will administer salvation and exaltation to their offspring. Thus they are acting in the capacity of God to those children. As an aside, this quote is a little misleading as it actually only applies to the husband. The wife will only be involved in procreating those children, not in answering their prayers. And we can show that because the Mormons today do not pray to Heavenly Mother. So what is our purpose in life? The Bible does not teach that man's goal is personal godhood, but to bring glory to the one eternal God, our Creator. Isaiah 43.11 records God as saying, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Further on, Isaiah 48 says, My glory I will not give to another. And yet Mormonism is saying God's going to give his glory to millions of other men that will advance to Godhood like he did. According to 1 Peter 4.11, all things are to be done with the goal of bringing glory to the Father. The Christian plan of salvation is summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's nothing there about personal exaltation to Godhood. Nothing about eternal marriage. We are sinners saved by grace, not gods in embryo, as declared by past prophet Spencer W. Kimball. The second point in the testimony glove is... Uh, a picture of Jesus that the girl puts on one finger. While the uh, book does teach that Jesus is our Savior, it does not elaborate on their doctrine that Christ's atonement is just the first step in our ability to acquire eternal life. Besides the atonement, according to Mormonism, one must also live a faithful LDS life, hold the Melchizedek priesthood, and fully participate in their temple ritual throughout life in order to qualify to live in Heavenly Father's presence. Eternal life is also referred to as exaltation or Godhood. And this is so important that you understand the terminology differences. Going to heaven doesn't mean you have eternal life. Having immortality, immortality does not mean you have eternal life. Eternal life is defined as having been married in the temple and procreating children forever. It's the ability to procreate life eternally. Mormonism redefined all the words. 
The Mormon values Christ's atonement as an essential element in their eternal life, but not the full payment. In the February 2003 Enzyme, LDS Apostle Russell M. Nelson explained <coughs> that the difference between simply receiving the gift of immortality as opposed to the goal of qualifying for eternal life. Quote, thanks to the atonement, the gift of immortality is unconditional. See, they make that saved by grace. Immortality, meaning just resurrection. He goes on. The greatest gift of eternal life, however, is conditional. In order to qualify, one must deny oneself of ungodliness and honor the ordinances and covenants of the temple. So you see how they're adding to the New Testament concept of eternal life. It has to be married to temple ritual in order for you to achieve this. Keep in mind that Mormons make a distinction between immortality and eternal life. They view Christ's atonement as a guarantee of resurrection and the ability to live forever, but they do not believe that this is the same as eternal life. That's, uh, they, their goal and hope is to procreate millions of spirit children that someday will be sent to the earth that they will create. Thus we th see that for the Mormon, Christ's atonement isn't enough to return to Heavenly Father. The person must be a fully active temple-going member of the LDS Church in order to merit eternal life. In Mormonism, saved by grace means resurrection to some level of heaven, but isn't to be confused with eternal life, which is equated with godhood in the highest level of heaven. If eternal life or exaltation is conditional and something for which we must, quote, qualify, then it is not a gift, but a reward. The Christian's hope is summed up in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And as we come out of Mormonism, that is an important concept to get hold of, that it is our faith that makes us right with God. It's faith in Christ's work on the cross. The next picture the child was going to put on his finger is a picture of Joseph Smith. And in the book it says, the third truth is that Joseph Smith saw Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. I know that Joseph Smith is the prophet who was called to restore the gospel and translate the Book of Mormon, end of quote. This statement brings up three separate issues. First, Joseph Smith's first vision, which supposedly revealed to him that God and Jesus were separate deities with resurrected bodies. It also says the LDS claim that Joseph Smith restored the true gospel, which implies all the Christians outside of Mormonism do not have the true gospel. And the validity of the Book of Mormon, which opens the door for scriptures and doctrines beyond the Bible. Regarding the 1820 appearance of God and Jesus, Joseph Smith did not commit this vision to paper until 1832, and later accounts contain significant differences. So you have a 12-year gap there from when it's supposed to have happened before he even writes it down privately. The earliest account only mentions Jesus as appearing. Then in 1835, he mentions many angels in the vision. It wasn't until 1838 that he wrote the account that says the father and son appeared to him. In the early 1830s, neither LDS nor non-LDS sources raised the issue of an 1820 vision or that Joseph Smith was teaching an anthropomorphic deity. This was a doctrinal development of the 1840s in Nauvoo, Illinois. I think that's really important that when you look at the earliest criticism of Mormonism, it was not on the nature of God. Why? Because he wasn't teaching plural gods at the beginning of Mormonism. Keep in mind that Mormons are not just saying God could appear as a man, but that eons ago he actually was a finite being on some other world, married, had children, died, was resurrected, and then achieved his current level of godhood. Joseph Smith preached, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. That is the great secret. I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And this is not just a past teaching of Mormonism. Joseph Smith's sermon is currently quoted in a number of LDS church manuals that they are currently using in their classes. I often talk to Mormons who are unacquainted with Smith's sermon on the nature of God, but if one is going to assert that he is a prophet 
the accuracy of his teaching on God is of vital importance. One of the tests of a prophet is laid out in Deuteronomy 13, where it says that a true prophet will not lead you after a strange God. I find many Mormons have never read Smith's sermons. There's two different sermons on the nature of God where Joseph Smith very specifically taught an evolving God with a God above him. Most Mormons have not read it. Uh, we post both sermons on our website, <laughs> commercial, um, where you can read them. Because sometimes when I'm talking with Mormon, I'll say, uh, well, they'll say, well, why can't you be a Mormon? And I said, well, I can't agree with Joseph Smith's doctrine of God. Uh, how do you feel about what he taught about God? And they'll usually say, I don't know. I, I said, well, have you ever read his sermons? No, I've never read. No. Okay. Uh, if I give you a copy of Joseph Smith's sermon, would you read it so we could discuss it? <laughs> Because they usually have not read his sermons, and they don't know that. And a lot of the Mormons will say to me, I just believe in one God. I believe God's eternal. And I say, well, that's wonderful. I'm glad that's what you believe. But then I don't understand why you want to be a Mormon, because that's not what Joseph Smith taught. So, okay. The next problem with the child's testimony is that she knows that Joseph Smith, as God's prophet, restored the true gospel. And the importance of Joseph Smith is canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 135. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. And part of the reason behind that is that for you to have eternal life, you've got to accept Joseph Smith as a prophet of God. It isn't enough to accept Jesus. You've got to have Joseph Smith and believe his doctrines in order to have eternal life. The Elders Church is not just claiming to be a better church than the one down the road, but the only true church recognized by God. When they talk about Smith restoring the gospel, they are talking about the doctrines laid out in the Doctrine of Covenants and proliferate great Christ, not the gospel presented in the New Testament. Smith taught that Christ's atonement was just the first installment on our eternal life. We must now faithfully participate in all the LDS rituals and practices to return to our Heavenly Father and achieve exaltation. Apostle Bruce R. McConkie defined the gospel as follows. The gospel is the plan of salvation. It consists of the laws, ordinances, and eternal truths by conformity to which the spirit children of God can progress and advance until they become like their eternal parent. That's their gospel. Many times when someone leaves Mormonism, uh, and they'll come in and talk to me in the bookstore. They say, oh, I don't believe Joseph Smith's a prophet anymore, but I just love the gospel. At that point, you need to ask them, can you define gospel for me? Because I find that when they say that, they're usually still hanging on to pre-existence and eternal advancement. They may not believe it requires a temple ritual, but this, this drama of our purpose in life stays with them. They have to see the Bible does not teach that we lived in heaven as spirit kids of God and his wife, and we are not trying to get to some eternal glory uh, that's for ourselves. So even when they lose Joseph Smith, sometimes they'll hang on to elements of Mormon doctrine. The Mormon gospel is one of Christ plus self-effort and centers around a personal quest for exaltation. The Christian gospel is centered in Christ. Heavenly Father did not place us here to seek personal exaltation, but to bring glory to the one eternal holy God. Another problem is the assertion that Smith's prophetic call included the translation of the Book of Mormon. But there's no evidence for the story, no evidence for the plates, no one physically saw them. There's no artifacts, no inscriptions, no monuments, nothing that ties the Book of Mormon to the American Indian. The Book of Mormon echoes the assumptions of Smith's day about the American Indians that's no longer valid. Uh, scholars today don't believe that uh, the Indians are descended from Israelites. The fourth is the claim of uh, excessive plagiarism from the King James Bible throughout the Book of Mormon that shows it can't be an ancient text. <clears throat> this brings us to the fourth picture, which is the LDS Temple. In the book, the child says, I know that being married in the temple like mom and dad makes it possible for our family be, to be sealed together forever. 
LDS temple marriage is repeatedly emphasized in various instruction manuals. But if temple marriage were this important in God's plan, one wonders why it was never mentioned in the Bible or Book of Mormon. The emphasis on temples and it's an example of the way Mormon doctrine latches onto a particular Bible term and then infuses it with different meaning. In the Old Testament, the temple, along with its animal sacrifice, was symbolic of Christ's future atonement for sin. Once Christ died on the cross and was resurrected, there was no longer any need for animal sacrifice of the Old Testament. Jesus replaced the Old Covenant. As an example of the way LDS prophets have twisted the scriptures is this statement by LDS President Spencer W. Kimball. Only through celestial marriage, meaning temple marriage, can one find the straight way, the narrow path. Eternal life cannot be had in any other way. End of quote. Kimball is alluding to Jesus' statement in Matthew 7:14, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. However, there's nothing in that passage that would connect eternal life to marriage. In fact, Jesus plainly stated that there was no marriage in heaven in Matthew 22:30. <clears throat> Obviously, Paul didn't have such a doctrine. In Romans 7, 2, he wrote that when a man dies, his wife is free of that marriage. <clears throat> if Paul believed that marriage continued in heaven as was, and was essential for eternal life, why didn't he ever mention it? He also, marriages were never performed in the Jewish temple, and the first century Christians didn't build their own temples. They were meeting in homes of believers. Another curious fact is that the doctrine of eternal marriage isn't even taught in the Book of Mormon even though the Book of Mormon supposedly contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Another difference is the secrecy surrounding the LDS temple ceremony. The Jewish rituals are spelled out in the Old Testament. There's no secret about them. Yet the Mormon takes an oath to never divulge the temple ceremony to anyone. In fact, they aren't supposed to discuss it amongst their own members outside of the temple. The doctrine of eternal marriage comes from section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. But the original point of this revelation was dictated so that uh, it could be shown to Joseph's wife, Emma, to convince her of plural marriage. And that it's, it was originally understood as a revelation to convince her of polygamy. And today the Mormons have separated out, oh, well, that's just a side issue. The main issue of the revelation is uh, that you've got to have temple marriage. Well, just read it, and you'll see that it's all about polygamy. Even though the LDS Church currently tries to distance itself from the doctrine of polygamy, their sealing practices demonstrate that they still believe people will live polygamy in the celestial kingdom. As an example, Kristen Oaks, the woman that wrote this book, the testimony book, was sealed in marriage to Apostle Gallon Oaks after his first wife died. He now has an eternal marriage sealing to two women, thus guaranteeing, according to LDS teachings, that he will be a polygamist in heaven, and Chris, Kristen will be wife number two. I don't know how she feels about that, but... <clears throat> the polygamist groups and the LDS Church all believe that plural marriage prior to 1890 were ordained of God, and that those with the proper sealing will be able to live polygamy in heaven. The only difference is whether they believe a person may currently live polygamy on earth. Another aspect of the LDS teaching on eternal marriage is their doctrine that there is a heavenly mother as well as a heavenly father. Spencer W. Kimball once said, God made man in his own image, and certainly he made woman in the image of his wife partner. I find many times a Mormon has never thought through that there's a heavenly mother, but it's sprinkled through their books. Uh, and anyone needs a reference on it, I can get it for you, but... Uh, that's very much a part of the whole theology. That's why you're getting sealed in the temple, so you have a heavenly mother and a heavenly father to have all these children. According to Brigham Young, Joseph Smith once said, I would not worship a God who had not a father, and I do not know that he would if he had not a mother. The one would be as absurd as the other. Even though Mormonism teaches that there is a heavenly mother, members are taught that they are not to pray to her. In the October 1991 LDS conference, President Hinckley instructed members that, quote, in light of the instruction we have received from the Lord himself, 
I regard it as inappropriate for anyone in the church to pray to our mother in heaven. The fact that we do not pray to our mother in heaven in no way belittles or denigrates her. While President Hinckley said the prohibition on praying to Heavenly Mother in no way belittles her, it surely makes her a silent partner. Okay. And the last picture to be attached to the glove is current President Thomas Monson. The girl in the story then testifies, I know that we are led by a living prophet who gets revelation from God. One wonders how the girl in the book was supposed to know that Monson gets revelations. The Mormon Church has not presented any revelation to the church body since 1978 when the church uh, extended the priesthood to blacks. One could argue that the leaders pray for guidance and feel a spiritual conviction to proceed in a particular way, but how would this differ from thousands of Christians who pray daily for direction? Her testimony is simply a matter of parroting her parents' statements and the statements of the LDS church leaders. Joseph Smith claimed that in 1830, God instructed the founding members of the LDS Church to receive his words as if from mine own mouth. This is still the position of the LDS Church. When the prophets speak, they speak for God. The importance of a living prophet was driven home in the October 2010 LDS Conference when two different church leaders made reference to past president Ezra Taft Benson's talk on 14 fundamentals in following the prophet. Benson proclaimed that the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works, which would include the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. In fact, his speech is held in such high regard that it has been printed in its entirety in the 2010 manual, Teachings of the Living Prophets. By asserting the supremacy of a current prophet's teachings over all previous scripture, it eliminates any test for truthfulness. But this raises the question as to how any Mormon can have confidence that what he currently believes and affirms will be equally true next year. The LDS leaders would deny that they are teaching the members to have blind faith in them by pointing to speeches where they counsel the member to seek for divine confirmation through prayer. However, a person is still expected to come up with an answer to obey the leaders. Speaking at the April 2001 conference, Apostle Ballard instructed the members, quote, if you will listen to the living prophet and the apostles and heed our counsel, you will not go astray. This was further emphasized in 2010 LDS manual, Teachings of the Living Prophets. Quote, speaking under the direction of the Holy Ghost, the living prophet's words take pre precedent over other statements on the same issue. Doctrine and eternity do not change. However, the Lord, through his prophet, may change practices and programs according to the needs of the people. But historically, we see a trail of past teachings and scriptures that have been changed or eliminated. The LDS Church scriptures have gone through repeated editing, with se severe changes being made, and several of Joseph Smith's revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants going on through tremendous editing. In spite of the many changes, the leadership continues to assert that the LDS Church is the restored gospel. It's Peter warned the Christian community that there would be false teachers that would preach damnable heresies. Certainly Mormonism comes under this heading. To say that anything, any ritual, could add to the work of Christ is belittling his atonement. The writer of Hebrews summed it up this way, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The high priest in the Old Testament did not sit down in the temple. The metaphor of Jesus sitting down indicated that the atonement had been finished. It was complete. 1 John 1930, we read that after Jesus hung on the cross for hours, he finally said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. We need to get hold of the implications of that statement. It is finished. The good news is that Christ accomplished everything that needed to be done for us to be made whole in the eyes of God. It is our joy and responsibility to share the biblical gospel with our LDS friends, that they too may find the narrow way 
that leads to eternal life. Thank you.